Hey guys, so let's discuss about the clinical question number 14. So a 66 year old woman with systolic lymph ventricular dysfunction. So note this point, okay, this is an important point in this clinical cue. Comes to the casualty due to dizziness, palpitation and shortness of breath. Note this point also, this is also a symptom of a very important cardiac. The symptoms started two days ago and have become progressively worse. The cardiologist prescribed an extra dose of oral furosemide yesterday, but her symptoms did not improve. Okay. Six weeks ago, she was admitted for acute decompensated heart failure. Okay. Acute decompensated heart failure that was thought to be precipitated by atrial fibrillation. So this patient had atrial fibrillation. Keep that in mind. The patient underwent electrical cardioversion and was diurist with marked symptomatic improvement. Okay, fine. She has a history of atrial fibrillation. Okay. Hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus, coronary artery disease, ischemic cardiomyopathy with a 30% ejection fraction and osteoarthritis. So she underwent coronary artery bypass grafting five years ago. Okay. Her, her current medication includes uh, low dose aspirin, metoprolol, lisinopril, rosuvastatin, long acting insulin, rivaroxaban, furosemide, and ibuprofen. The patient has been adherent to her medical uh, regimen. Okay. She does not use tobacco or alcohol. Temperature was 98 degree Fahrenheit. Blood pressure is 126.80 in normal range. Pulse is 132. Per minute, there's a tachycardia and irregular, and respirations are 19 per minute. That shows that she had uh, arrhythmia. Hmm? Physical examination reveals bibasilar crackles, so that means she had heart failure, most probably a systemic heart failure, left heart failure. Clearly, regular heart sounds, fine with no audible murmurs. There is one plus symmetric peripheral edema. The ECG shows atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. Serum creatinine level is 0.8. Fine. After initial treatment, electrical cardioversion is planned. Okay. Which of the following is the most appropriate medication for long-term management of this patient? So basically, uh, to sum up, this patient is suffering from, she has a left ventricular dysfunction. Okay. This and uh, this patient is having a repeated atrial fibrillation and she's taking a lot of medicines as has all noted and she's also diabetic things. There's a lot of things that's been told. So these most, the most important key points for us is that this patient has LV, less left ventricular dysfunction and she, this patient is getting atrial fibrillations, atrial fibrillations, a lot of AFs are coming up. So these are the options, there's Amiron, Flocanide, uh, Ranolizine, Walsatin. Okay, before answering, let's see what, like you have to understand the uh, table. So the table mainly depicts the antiarrhythmic drugs and which can be given during an atrial fibrillation. So you have to uh, like categorize the atrial fibrillation if, into four scenarios, okay. So a patient with AF, but he had no CAD, coronary artery disease or a structural heart disease. In that case, you can give the patient the preferred uh, drug should be flaconide propafinol. Uh, flaconide is a 1C antiarrhythmic drug. Okay. Uh, and if a patient is having a history of left ventricular hypertrophy, then the best drug that can be given is amiodarone and bronidinone. Okay. Then another uh, the next thing is coronary artery disease without heart failure in that case also we provide amiodarone and dofipilac hmm? and the recurrent af symptoms are refractory to medication in that case even if we give the uh, medicines the patient uh, keeps on having the af symptoms in that case it's uh, the only option we have is the radio frequency ablation now let's see what this patient had come with. The, the complaint that the patient came with was, or the symptoms with which the patient came was dizziness, palpitation, shortness of breath. See, you have dizziness, palpitation, shortness of breath as symptom, and you have the sign like pedal edema, and uh, uh, and on examination you get bibasilar crackles. Don't think of anything else. This patient, and you have also have tachycardia things like that. You, you, this patient has left heart failure or a systemic heart failure. This patient is suffering from systemic heart failure, has undergone a systemic heart failure. And how did this patient get the systemic heart failure? In that, you get these signs like uh, the pulse is 132 per minute, then uh, the, the, the pulse is more like an irregularly irregular kind of pulse, and things like that. And when you take an ECG, you will get 
any AF, AF pattern, AF pattern. So this AF was the trigger for the left heart failure and the, and the symptoms were what? Like the dizziness, palpitation, shortness of breath, pedal edema. So left heart failure, uncontrolled AF led to left heart failure and the symptoms is shown as well. So first of all, we have to understand what is the management. Okay, the basic criteria this patient is having in this clinical queue is AF. So how are you going to manage the AF? So you can manage the AF by three methods. So basic, the basic motto to manage the AF is the thromboembolism. Okay, the thromboembolism and keep the heart rate in check. Okay. So the three methods are you can use an anticoagulant like a river rock saran. Okay, that's one thing. You can use a rate control by AV nodal blocking agents like beta blockers. This patient is already on a beta blocker or a lot. And you can use the rhythm control methods by antiarrhythmic agents. And you have to understand that a rate control method is better than a rhythm control method. You know why? Because this rhythm control method has less efficacy okay but there is a lot of side effects and lot of side effects so more safer scenario is going with a beta blocker for an AF patient but but mind that if this patient even with the rate control methods is enough enable to uh, like maintain the heart rate or have a persistent heart failure even with the rate control agents then you have to go with an antiarrhythmic agent. So the thing is that in this patient, this patient has a recurrent AF. So don't think about anything else. The thing that has to come to your mind is the long-term medication should be an antiarrhythmic agent because she's already on propanolol and things like that. So she should be on an antiarrhythmic agent. Now, talking about the antiarrhythmic agent, which antiarrhythmic agent are you going to give this patient? That is where we have to look into the four clinical scenarios that I have talked before. That is, if the patient has, you have to check for the history that the patient, if it's having no CADs, then you have to go for flicanide. The patient has ventricular, left ventricular hypertrophy, then you have to go for amiodarone. This patient has a coronary artery disease, but without a heart failure, then go for an amiodarone. And if the patient has a recurrent, recurrent, uh, like if you gave them any kind of medicine and still this patient has no, uh, like there is no benefits for this patient, then you have no other chance but do, uh, do a radio frequency ablation. So, talking briefly, you have what are the antiarrhythmic drugs, the classification. You have class 1, which blocks the sodium channel. Okay? So, of this we have 1A, 1B and 1C. In the option we have flicanide. Flicanide is a 1C drug. Hmm? And uh, the, it's a 1C antiarrhythmic agent. But it is not recommended for the rhythm control in patients without cardiovascular, it is, oh, sorry, it is basically recommended in patients without cardiovascular comorbidities. But this patient is already having a cardiovascular comorbidity, so we cannot give them flicanide. Okay, we cannot give them flicanide. So the point to remember over here is, is an antiarrhythmic agent. This is an antiarrhythmic agent, and these two have less antiarrhythmic effects, so you can just uh, opt out these options. And in flicanide, the thing is that it's a 1C antiarrhythmic agent, but it's given when a patient does not have any cardiovascular uh, problems, comorbidities. Why? Because it is contraindicated in patients with this coronary heart disease. And there is increased risk of arrhythmias and even death in these kind of patients. So if you should not give them. Then the only option you have is the amniotum. And this patient is having only a, uh, having a coronary artery disease. And then you have to give amiodarone, and the amiodarone is a class 3, it's a class 3 and the arrhythmic So let's talk about uh, the other two options, that is ranolazine. See, ranolazine is, uh, is a, it's an anti-arrhythmic effect, has anti-arrhythmic effect similar to 1D, uh, but uh, the efficacy is very less and the rhythm control of AF uh, is not, uh, it's just very less, it's, the demonstration is very less. So you can close down that close that option off and then the next is Valsartan. So Valsartan is actually a it's an angiotensin 2 receptor blocker. It's an angiotensin 2 receptor blocker and it's mainly indicated in patients with LV systolic dysfunction. Okay and there should not be and one thing that you have to remember over here is that they sh should never be combined with particular drug that is lisinopril. Okay this patient is already 
on lisinopril as you can see this patient is already on lisinopril so valsartan and lisinopril there is a drug interaction uh, and uh, it can lead to hyperkalemia so side effects like hyperkalemia so so that has to be avoided so that's the answer so the answer will be amiodarone amiodarone is the answer so for so you guys just follow us on more instagram facebook and telegram we will be uploading more of uh, video contents uh, video explanation of the clinical uh, cues and uh, let us know like give us your feedback on like how uh, are you able to understand what like, we have to change our method of explanation thank you very much